Amen. Yeah, the, the essential nature of covenant community and thinking in those terms is huge. Church is not, it's not a social club. You can't have an effective army if everybody in your battalion just kind of rotates out of the battalion every couple of months. You never develop a cohesive brotherhood that's used to dealing with things together because they've gone through the battles together because it's just a bunch of new faces again, and we've never built that kind of, those kinds of ties, and that's essential. We want that. And so we've been talking about maturity. Here is some thoughts on maturity here from Luke chapter 5, and a parable of Jesus's that I have often struggled to understand, and I am certainly open to to continuing to grow in my understanding of it, but I think I got, I think I got something here, so I will share it and, and submit to the review of others who have, have scriptural takes, but I do think that this, this is, I think I'm onto something here, and I wanted to share it with you all, so this is Luke chapter 5, and if I were going to title my little, little sermonette, whatever you want to call it, I would say, are we annoyed by grace? would be my title. Are we annoyed by grace? Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27. After that, he went out and noticed an IRS agent. Oh, and it says a tax collector. But in modern parlance, that would be what? It would be an IRS agent, right? Because who were the tax collectors? They were, they were traitors. They're helping the Romans. They're tyrannizing over the Jews. They were not popular. Yeah, IRS agent. It's pretty, pretty fitting. Named Levi, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees were annoyed by grace. The Pharisees were annoyed by by the fact that Jesus interacted with the, the bad guys, the annoying people, the yucky people, the tax collectors and the sinners. And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new for he says the old is good enough. So the question when reading this parable of Jesus is what exactly is the old wine? And what, is the, what are the new wineskins? And what is the, the old cloth or the old garment and the, the new garment? What is he talking about? To understand the parable, we have to identify what the old and the new are. Is Jesus talking about the old covenant? Is he talking about the law and the prophets? Well, let's, let's test that for a second. If Jesus is talking about the law and the prophets, then he's basically saying the new covenant doesn't work with the old covenant. We, can't, we need to basically set aside the Old Testament because now I'm here and we're getting rid of that stuff and now we're doing it this new way. But we know that doesn't square with what the rest of the New Testament makes obvious. Jesus says, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So... It wouldn't make sense that Jesus here is just saying, yeah, Moses, Elijah, all that, that's, that's old wineskins, that's old garment, that's done away. We're abandoning all of that. That wouldn't square with any of the other teaching in the New Testament. So that eliminates that potential interpretation. So what then is the old garment? My contention, my suggestion is that the old garment would be the traditions of men, the traditions of the Pharisees, the things that they have gotten comfortable with and used to, Jesus is not saying, Jesus is not rebuking Moses. 
Jesus is not saying we're done with we're done with God's law. We're done with obeying the Old Testament scriptures. But he is confronting them. He is saying he's bringing something new here and their hearts cannot receive it. Their hearts are stuck in their traditions, hardened in their traditions. They're not ready to receive the glorious new covenant wine. The new covenant wine will burst the hardened wineskins of their pharisaical hearts. So if you force the new covenant into the old covenant traditions, not only are you going to actually ruin the proper continuity between the two, but you're also going to both mess up the gospel and you're going to mess up the entire point of the Old Testament. We have to see the two meshed biblically and understand the new covenant as the fulfillment of the old covenant. If, however, we're stuck in our traditions, then we will be annoyed by grace. So the application that I'm seeing here is this. How often am I concerned about what people's externals are like or whether they have the same traditions or applications while missing the heart level, the heart level issue, the heart level priority? How often do I look at someone else and say, they're, they're clearly not a real Christian because look at the way they do their hair. Look at, look at what they wear. Look at fill in the blank. Look, this is how I was raised and they don't do it the way I was raised. Is that a biblical picture? Is that a biblical heart of love or is that a pharisaical heart of tradition? They do not keep my traditions. Now, this is not to say that God doesn't have anything to say about what we wear or how we do our hair or whether or not we celebrate certain holidays or fill in the blank. There's certainly scriptural principles that should apply to those things. We have a propensity to go to either one side or the other. The one side is none of it matters. It's just grace. It's all grace. God has nothing to say. None of it. It's just irrelevant. It's all about the heart. And then on the other side, we have... Oh, it, not only does it matter, but it's, it's essential. It's primary. If you don't agree with me on how long your skirts are allowed to be, then you're basically an apostate. Well, that's not biblical either. It is a heart issue, but as part of having hearts that follow Christ, it should spill over into, hey, so what does Jesus think about what we wear? What does Jesus think about the music we listen to? And we talk about these things and we explore biblical principles. But if you get to a point where you're annoyed by grace then that's a good clue that you're, getting too, you're going too far in the application side of things. If you get to a point where you don't want to dine with the tax collectors and the sinners, you don't want to dine with that person because they make you uncomfortable, because they don't look like you, because, they don't, um, because they're an IRS agent, fill in the blank, then we're missing the heart of the gospel. And we need to stop and we need to pray and get on our face until we understand and have a proper perspective of how much we've been forgiven. That's what Jesus says about the woman of the night, woman of ill repute, who comes in and worships him and honors him. And he says, he who's been forgiven much, loves much. Shame on us if our hearts are more like the hearts of the disciples who are watching saying, why are you letting her in here? Get rid of her. She's She's gross. And Jesus says, she who has been forgiven much, loves much. And what what category does that put me in? That puts me in the category of, I think I've been forgiven little, and so I love little. If If that's where I'm coming from, if that's what my attitude does, if I am annoyed by grace, then I probably don't understand the grace that I've been given. I probably do not see the gospel in its full color and see that I was dead in my trespasses and sins and see that without Christ, I'm, I'm just as lost as anyone else. If I don't see myself as a beggar who found bread, then I get annoyed by other beggars finding bread. In fact, I might even get annoyed by how happy they are that they found bread. Isn't that terrible? It's true though. I, you, you get annoyed by someone because they are so happy in the gospel. That shows that we're missing it. We are missing it, and we are acting like the Pharisees. We have old garments in our hearts. We have old wineskins that cannot hold the new wine of the gospel. 
We don't want that to be us. So let us meditate on the beauty and the wonder of what we've been saved from by God so that we can go into the world around us and rejoice in grace and share grace and give grace and proclaim grace rather than being annoyed by grace and deciding who does and who doesn't deserve grace. We've got to remember that we didn't deserve grace and it was only because of the glorious condescension of God that we get to have any wineskins at all that let alone get to taste of the new wine of the gospel, which we should be ready to share and to rejoice in others partaking in as well. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me just ask the men.